Hey everyone, if you haven't met me yet, I'm Henty. I'm one of the student ministry pastors here at Kane Kills. And thanks so much for joining us today. I know we're kind of in a crazy season right now where we are practicing social distancing out of love for one another and for our neighbors. But we just want you to know that we miss you guys. We miss getting to see you guys on Wednesdays at Ignite and Sunday mornings where we get to worship and, 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 and open up God's word together. Our team has been thinking about you. We're praying for you. We're, we're hoping that you guys are still getting connected through our, uh, through our life groups on Zoom on Sunday evenings or uh, whenever you guys' group meets. Uh, but also, we're working really hard behind the scenes to be able to try and cultivate some kind of meaningful connection in this season uh, where we are separated from each other. And one of the ways we've been trying to do that is that we are continuing to post sermons every single Sunday. Uh, so you can count on us. You can rely on us for that. That every Sunday, whether it's me, whether it's Matt, whether it's Connor, we're going to be here opening up God's word, ready to teach, ready to encourage you and to help you to grow in these coming weeks, except for next week. <laughs> next week is Easter, and we're going to encourage all of you guys to get together as a family, to get together and watch uh, the sermon that Pastor Steve has prepared for our church and to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We would really love for you to do that. And just so you know, right when the week after April 19th, when you come back, we're going to be starting a brand new six week series on Psalm 23. We just thought it would be really great uh, in these next couple of weeks as we won't be able to be together to think deeply about how God in heaven is our good shepherd, how he walks through uh, the most difficult seasons of life with us and how he is faithful and he is good to us that his mercy and his goodness follow us all the days of our lives. And so we just really pray that uh, for those six weeks that you'll be encouraged and you'll be able to join us as we rest in God's promises together. But this week we are wrapping up our series on hooked. We've been talking about how can we fight against uh, getting hooked by the lure of temptation and rather how can we, instead of living in the life of temptation, that we can live the kind of lives that God has called us to do where we're obedient to what he's done and we're living by the power of his resurrection and we're living in his grace. So if you have a Bible with you or if you don't have one, just hit the pause button on the bottom left and go grab it. I'll be right here when you get back. We're going to be in Hebrews 12 verses 1 through 5. Hebrews 12, 1 through 5. And the truth we're going to try and focus on today is this, is that Jesus didn't get hooked for us. Now, it's a bit of a tongue twister, but here's what it's saying. It's saying that Jesus didn't bite into the hook of temptation. He didn't do that. And he did that so that we would have the power to be able to resist temptation as well. Jesus lived uh, he resisted and, and lived a perfect life. He resisted all of the temptation that we encounter today, and he didn't give in. Rather, he obeyed the Father. And he did this so that we could be set free from our sins, so that we wouldn't have to be slaves to sin, but rather so we could be children of God, be a part of God's family. And so we're going to be focusing on that today. And that truth kind of reminds me of a pretty silly story from when I was a small child. I obviously don't remember it because I was about one or two years old, but my mom told me that when I was a little kid, there were two things that I liked. I really liked water and I really liked walking. So apparently a couple of times uh, th there was this occurrence that would happen where, you know, it'd be after a long day of me playing around and getting, getting messy and sweaty as little kids do. My mom would give me a bath, you know, and, and I'd be all clean. She'd me to get warm, get in clothes, get in my pajamas, get ready for bed. And she would go off and make dinner. And then she, as any mom does, because running a household is a lot of work, uh, she would lose track of me because I'm running and crawling around all over the place. And one point she just realized I wasn't there. And she was like, oh my gosh, where, where is he? And so she kind of like frantically begins to try and look for me. And then she looked outside and there I was soaking wet, shivering, freezing cold, sitting with my teeth chattering on top of the lawn sprinkler. I was literally sitting on top of the lawn sprinkler and I loved it, but I'm sitting there almost catching pneumonia with how cold I was. And my mom, obviously, like any good mother did with, with absolute horror, ran outside to come and get me and to get me all warm again and, and to put a new set of clothes on me. But the thing is, I would do this kind of often, sometimes multiple times in one evening. And so my mom would kind of get me bathe me, clean me, and, you know, get me ready for bed again, only for me to go outside and ruin it again by getting cold, and by getting dirty again, and by doing the same thing over and over again. She was, my mom was a great mom, but I was just a terrible kid. <laughs> but here's the thing, kids do silly things. Uh, but in a way, this is so similar to our spiritual lives. We often, uh, at times, we, we do just this. We confess our sins. Uh, we, we, we kind of, we get our relationship right with God. We repent of what, the, of what wrong we've done to know God's grace. 
And then just a couple minutes later, maybe an hour later, maybe a week later, a couple of days later, even a month or a year later, we just come right back to the sinful thing that we were doing before. And it's just like me, I, I, I would get clean and I would just run back out to the water. I get clean, just run back out to the water. But the thing is, is how do we stop ourselves from not only physically doing that, because that's not going to work out very well, but also spiritually. How do we stop ourselves from spiritually continuing to run back to sin and biting into the hook and into the lure of temptation? But we really have to know how to answer this question because Romans 6.1 is pretty clear. That if we think that God's grace is just like a get out of jail free card, that clearly we're not viewing it in the right way. If we abuse God's grace and we misuse it uh, and we use it as an excuse to sin, it shows that we don't understand it at all. So the question I have for you today that I have for really all of us is this. How do we live in the freedom of Christ and avoid the hook of temptation? How do we live in the freedom of Christ and avoid the hook of temptation. So I'm just gonna take a moment right now where I'm gonna share my screen with you because I'd love for you to be able to see some of the notes that I've taken. Um, and that way we can also just be able to, to grow and learn in this together. So if you will just look at the screen, you're gonna see it here. The way that we live in the, once again, if the, the, one, the, the way that we live in the life that God has called us to and we, and we avoid the hook of temptation is that we look to Jesus, our savior, and we trust in him. So once again, if you'll open up your Bibles to Hebrews 12, one through five, we're gonna read through this passage together and we're gonna see how Jesus modeled this for us and how to live the life that God I'm called to live and how he avoided temptation. So if you open up your Bibles, if you look with me at Hebrews 12, uh, one through five, we're just going to go right through here. He says, therefore, since we have been surrounded by such a great cloud, by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. So this huge crowd of witnesses that's being talked about here, um, really what it is, if I can just get my pen here, this huge crowd of witnesses that the writer is talking about is really just the, the whole family of God. It's talking about all the people who've believed in Jesus uh, and who believes in God, even from the Old Testament until now. We are surrounded by these people. They're people of the faith and they're encouraging us to look forward and look to Jesus. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. So we have to leave these things behind, especially the sin. We need to leave behind sin that so easily trips us up. See, sin trips us up all the time. Temptation trips us up all the time. And he says, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. This is really important. The race that God has set before us is our lives. And it takes endurance to run the race, to run the race of life that God has called us to. And so then he says, we do this. So the way that we run the life, we run the race of life with endurance, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. That's really the, the most important part that we need to see today is we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because, and this is the reason why Jesus why we look to Jesus, because of the joy awaiting him, the joy before him, as some translations say, the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he, that is Jesus, is seated in the place of honor. This is the reward at the place of honor beside God's throne. He is seated at the right hand of God. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, those people who spat on him, who beat him. And then you won't become weary weary and give up. See, we become weary and we give up sometimes in temptation. And Jesus is calling us not to do that, but rather to live in obedience to him, to, to be supplied by his power. And after all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. Jesus, we haven't given our lives in our struggle against sin, but Jesus has. Jesus gave up his life so that uh, we would know how to be able to fight sin. Now, this is a great passage, and especially it's a great passage as we look forward to celebrating Easter together. And so this next kind of, I guess the first point that I want us to be able to see here, and, and the, the, really the first, one of the first answers to how we live in the freedom of Christ and avoid the temptation. Once again, we trust in Jesus and we keep our eyes on him. But our, really our first point is this. Our first point is we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Let's look at verses one and two again. It says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Sin trips us up. He says, and let us run with endurance the race that God, that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, who is the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. 
And so I just want to ask you a question. Have you ever played any kind of sports before? Uh, if you have, if you've played basketball or whatever it is, uh, what you know is that if you're playing basketball and you're dribbling and all you're doing is focusing on the ball, you don't have no idea what's going on around you. It's the same thing like if you're running, if you're trying to run a race and all you're looking at your feet is you have no idea where you're going. You're just looking at your feet the whole time. And the thing is, is that what, 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 what happens is when we just focus on our feet or we just, tra- we just focus on a basketball when we're playing basketball, uh, we, we're not able to actually make a shot. If you're trying to take a shot and shoot and you're just looking at the basketball, you're going to miss the hoop completely. If you're running the race and all you're looking at is your feet and you're not looking at the finish line, you're never going to know where to go. But it's the same thing in a way, even if you don't play sports, that if you are writing a story, if you don't know what the end of the story is or what the kind of story you want to write, you're, you're just going to, your story is going to end up in a very weird place, in a different place you want it to be. If you're painting or you're drawing and you don't have an idea in your mind of what you're trying to paint or what you're trying to draw, even though details are really important and they can be beautiful, your picture is kind of not going to make a lot of sense. And in the same way, when we in our Christian lives, when we don't focus on Jesus and we just get caught up in ourselves and who we are and what we want to do and we get caught up in our sin, we are not able to run the race that God has called for us to live. We kind of just get lost. We, you know, we, we, we do this and we, we, we do this because we're, we're sinful, unfortunately. We, we tend to focus on the wrong things. And so we got to look, how does Jesus do it? Jesus did it by looking to his father in heaven. Once again, God had given him this promise. He said, you know, that, that, that if he was to follow through with everything that he did, that he would be rewarded. He would get to be able to, to sit at the right hand of the father. But not only that, but he did it because he had a relationship with the father in heaven. And this relationship that he had with the father in heaven, he knew that he wanted to please and obey his father. And so when he was on the cross, when he was in the garden being, and, and, and he was questioned about, should I go on with this? What does Jesus say? Jesus says, it's not my will, but your will, Father, that would be done. And in the same way, we get to do the same thing. We now get to look to Jesus. So how do we do this? We keep our eyes set on Jesus. We keep our eyes set on him by being in relationship with him. And we get to know him better by, once again, being in relationship with him. And the way that we grow our relationship is by spending time with him. We read our Bibles. We pray. We even meet together in our life groups with other people who are also part of the faith and who are also encouraging us to follow Jesus. We store up God's word, his character, his love, his grace, and his mercy in our hearts. See, the thing is that when we lose focus of Jesus, that is when we are most prone to bite the hook of temptation because we've forgotten Jesus. We've, we've, we've focused and we've set our mind on something else and we focus our eyes on sin. Uh, and that's not going to bring us joy. What's going to really bring us joy is being with Jesus. And so this leads us to our second point. And our second point is this. I'm going to kind of share my screen back with you again. But our second point is this. Hold on a second. I'm taking a bit longer than I wanted to. <laughs> our second point is this. We need to rely on God's promises. Once again, let's look at Hebrews 12, verse 2. It says, because of the joy awaiting him. See, this This is what Jesus was looking for. Because of the joy that was awaiting him, he endured the cross. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he's got the reward. He says, now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. He's seated at the right hand of God. But this phrase, because of the joy awaiting him, or some translations say, because of the joy set before him, this is why Jesus was able to fight against temptation and rather to, you know, to, to, to obey the father. But we see that there's kind of two different aspects to this joy that Jesus had. The first aspect of joy was obedience. I'm just going to write obey here. That's probably the worst handwriting you've ever seen. But Jesus wanted to be obedient to his father. He wanted to please his father. He loved his father and he wanted to do his father's will. And so he obeyed him. He followed what he wanted to do and that brought him most joy. But one of the other reasons was us. Jesus saw the joy, the joy of sinners being redeemed from their sin. And he wanted us to be a part of God's forever family. And so Jesus saw once again, the joy that was set before him. And he said, that is worth it. Obedience to the father, getting to see all these new people, these lost sinners like you and me brought into God's family for that, for God, for the, for God's people, I'll endure the pain of the cross. I'll disregard its shame. 
And now what we see is that because Jesus relied on God's promises, because Jesus relied on God's words, so can we. We can rely on the words that Jesus has said to us. And this even leads us to our, our, our second verse, which is a se- well, kind of a, not our second verse, but a couple of points on this is that th- there are some great verses in scripture that I'd love for you guys to kind of meditate on as you think about relying on God's promises and storing them up in your heart. Uh, one of them comes from Hebrews 13, just the chapter after this one in Hebrews 13, five and six, where it talks about how God will never, ever leave us nor forsake us. That is good news for us. God is never going to leave us nor forsake us. Another one is Hebrews 1, 6. Hebrews, I'm sorry. Philippians 1, 6. I'm getting all messed up here. Philippians 1, 6. It says that Christ is going to bring to completion the work that he started in us. Sometimes we give up on God, but God never, ever gives up on us. He's never going to leave us. And like Philippians 1, 6 says, he's never going to give up on us. And man, I spelt Romans there wrong in the PowerPoint, but hopefully I'll go back and correct it at some point. But Romans 5, 8 says, uh, it talks about how even when we are still sinners, that Christ died for us. That's the display of God's love. Even when we were far away from God, God still loved us and he died for us. And that's, those are promises that we can hold on to, that even when we're messy and even when, ooh, you know, we're, 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 we're difficult to love, God still loves us. And God's going to bring to completion the work that he started in us. So I pray that those promises would be encouraging to you as you are starting in your journey of faith. And our last point is this. I want to encourage you to live in God's power. Let's look look at Hebrews 12, verses 4 and 5. It says, think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. So what Jesus is talking about here is all those people who beat him, all those people who spat in his face, who mocked him. Think of all those people, those people. They wanted Jesus to fail, but he didn't. He says, and then you won't become weary and give up. See, when we are tempted, we don't have people maybe who are beating us, who are spitting in our faces. Rather, usually the temptation and and the temptation and the to to be hooked by sin, it kind of happens in our own mind. But Jesus endured all of that so that we wouldn't have to give up this temptation. He says, then you won't become weary and give up. And so we can pray to God to give us, to help us and to give us strength in all of what we're doing. And he says, after all, you have not given your lives in your struggle against sin. And what this is saying is that Jesus, Jesus, in fact, he has given his life in our struggle, in his, in the struggle against sin. Uh, obviously, he never gave in to sin, uh, but he gave his life so that we would know the power uh, of, of Jesus in, in his resurrection and putting sin into the grave forever and defeating its power. He, he destroyed that so that we would be able to walk in newness of life and freedom from sin so we get to live in god's power be reminded be reminded of a passage like romans 8 11 where it talks about how the resurrection power of jesus lives in us through the holy spirit be reminded of first corinthians 10 13 where it talks about how jesus will always provide a way of escape from us in the moment of temptation and so i just want to give you three really practical things three really practical ways of how we can live in god's power today and here are the three things uh, I want to encourage you to pray, pray, uh, pr- pray to God. And I want to encourage you to pray a really simple prayer. And I'm just going to write it out here for you. Help me. This is a great prayer to pray to God and to ask God, God, help me to not give into temptation. And when you, when you pray that to God, when you ask him to help you trust in his grace and his mercy, remind yourself of one of those promises. Um, and then walk forward in obedience. Go, go and get out of whatever situation you're in and go and walk in obedience to Christ. Another thing we can do is read. Read God's word. Store God's word up in your heart. Remember some of those verses that we talked about. Romans 5 verse 8. Uh, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Philippians 1, 6. Go remember those promises where God promises to never leave you, to forsake you, to help you to grow in your faith and to help love you. And store God's word in your heart and use his truth as daggers to fight off the enemy, the, the lies of the evil one. And lastly, God has given us community. One of the ways that we live in God's power is that we live in relationship with other people. And when we live in relationship with other people and we are, are part of a life group, we're a part of a group of people who are helping us to grow in our faith, we get to know that and we get to see that God didn't design for us to do life by ourselves. He designed for us to do it with other people. And so I want to encourage you today to look to Jesus. 
Keep your eyes set on him. Rely on God's promises uh, in, in the fight against temptation. R rely on his word. His word has power, but also live in God's power. Ask him to help you. Pray to him. Read the Bible. Meet with other people who are going to be able to encourage you in the faith. We're so glad you guys are here with us, and we just pray that this series has been encouraging to you. We're really looking forward to opening up Psalm 23 with you right after Easter, but we just pray our praying for you, and we hope that you have a wonderful Easter celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We'll see you guys soon, and hang in there. We're praying for you.